All right, so last time we started talking about, we talked about a whole bunch of things, I imagine. Um, but we started to talk about making an order class. Uh, an order class being a class uh, for an order of, of pizzas. And we said that a pizza or an order really is comprised of uh, a list of pizzas. We're going to look at that a little closer today, that thought. First of all, that is... Um, that is one of the ways that objects can be related to each other is, or classes can be related to each other to be more accurate, is a class can be made up of other classes or other objects. All right? That's called composition. So for example, if we had a class for computer, there might be, it might contain a uh, a class for monitor, a class for keyboard, a class or an object for keyboard, an object for monitor, an object for CPU, an object for printer, whatever. Those things are parts of a computer. So they together they, they, they make up the computer. So the computer really is a composition of these other classes. Now an order is uh, comprised of uh, a list of pizzas and some customer information. I am, for now, anyhow, not going to make a separate class for customer. That's a design decision that you would have to make as you were studying it. Um, you'd have to see how relevant the customer was to the procedure. You know, are you tracking things based on customer? Uh, what questions would you ask of a customer? Things such as that. Um, so, I'm just going to have those stored uh, as attributes. Um, so we're going to use this to sort of talk about composition. We're going to use this to, to do three, three or four things. We're going to talk about composition. We're going to create a new class. We're going to review the stuff about constructors. And we are going to um, talk about a thing called an array list. All right? An array list. I don't know why I have it on there. I was going to write on there, but then I decided not to. Uh, an array list. There's a couple differences between an array and an array list. What is an array, first of all? How would you define an array? Collection of items. That's a good way to put it. Collection is a real good word. What's another another thing that you could say about an array? Yeah. It is a collection of one type of things. That's, that's very true. So example, uh, in your very first assignment, you had arrays of strings to put in your, in, your, in your Mad Lib, where you could go and randomly generate a number, and then you put that element in, in uh, the output. All right, so it's an array. It's a list of like items, would be a good way to put it. Now there's a, there's a small restriction about uh, arrays, um, and the restriction is that when you declare an array, you have to declare how big it's going to be. So I'm going to say I'm going to have something that contains ten numbers, or you say I'm going to have an array that contains these elements. So, for example, you know, um, you might say um, array A equals new array and then have a list of elements after it that says the, the, the list of, of things that are after it. And if there's four things, then there's four items in the array. And the array subscript goes from zero to three. The other thing, uh, is, so arrays like that are not very dynamic. By dynamic, I mean it's not easy to change. You have to, you have to specify how many is going to be on there. Uh, things like inserting and deleting become a problem. All right? If we were to get rid of, if we had code to get rid of the third item in, a, in, a, in an array, there'd be sort of a, a hole in the array in the third space. Much better is what's called is a structure called an array list. All right? And here's the chief advantages of array lists. And there's only one disadvantage, and it's really not that big of a disadvantage. 
Um, an array list um, contains a list that is dynamic. That is, it can be expanded or contracted. So I could add things from the list. I could delete things from the list. And the list will get bigger and smaller based on what I've added or deleted. Uh, I can put things in specific places. So for example, if I had an array that had, let's say, eight elements, and I wanted to put something between element three and four, I'd have to write some code to do that, to like ripple things down the array. With an array list, you can just say, I want to put it at that point, and it sort of just expands it and puts it in position. So it's really good as far as lists that can change, lists that are dynamics. And in the case of a, a pizza order, an array list is, is a good choice, because I don't know how many pizzas are going to be on the order. So I can't, so, you know, I can't create an array. Um, I could, you know, I could maybe make some assumptions. But even those probably wouldn't be good. How many, you know, most number of pizzas anyone ever ordered at one time? Who knows? I don't want my system to depend on me getting the answer to that question right. All right? Especially when very easily I can create an array list that can handle that. All right? So that's what we're going to go with today with an array list. Now, an array list. Um, you refer to the elements, you can refer to the elements by number, but you refer to them a little bit differently. And you declare them a little bit differently. And you add them a little bit differently. So we'll see examples of all those things as we go through the example today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an array, I'm sorry, an order class. That's going Customer name, whether it's pickup or delivery, I'm going to for now address just in the interest of time. All right, so I'll just have a customer name. I'll have whether it's delivery or not, and then I ray list of pizzas. Now, what we have for this? We're going to have we're going to have some constructors, but I'm going to leave those off for now. All right, we'll come back to the constructor for this. Um, I'm going to have um, a to the order. I'm going to have a calculate cost and calculate bake time. The cost is simply going to be the sum of all the costs of the pizzas plus, if it's delivery, an extra $2. All right, $2 delivery charge. For the bake time, the, the bake time for this order is going to be the maximum of the bake time of all the pizzas. All right, so I, I, that, that depends on having a, an oven of unlimited size, but we're going to pretend that we do have an oven of an unlimited size. This could actually get real complicated if, if we had uh, an oven that only took two pizzas in at the same time or something like that. But again, we're going we're gonna to keep it simple. All right. So let's download what we had before, and let's build on it.
All right. This is the one I want. So I'm going to go into my notepad plus plus. And I'm going to start a new class. How do I create a class? Public class. And then the name of the class. What do we know about the name of the class? Let's capitalize. And then we know for sure it's going to have these braces that go around everything. <clears throat> what I usually do, just as a, a logistical point, is as I, if as I put in the one bracket, I immediately go and put the other bracket in. All right. That way, I don't. I hopefully don't forget uh, the bracketing. The nice thing about Notepad++ is that it color codes them. So if I put my mouse over here, it shows me it belongs to that. So I can sometimes use that um, if I get an error saying it's missing a bracket or it has one too many of one bracket or other. There is something in Java called Java Docs. And it's not necessarily the way to learn how to use something, all right? This is like a reference, all right? So it's tough to, to necessarily read this if you're going in for the first time, but it's a great place to go and look up how certain things work. So I'm going to keep this open as I go and, and build this, all right? I'm going to go in and I'm going to create. My actions. I always have to double check the syntax. I think I know how to do it, but. All right, this is what I am looking at. I'm going to create a private variable called, of type rather, array list. And then I'm going to put in these sort of triangle brackets, the class array list is going to contain. There's two kind of array lists that you can have. This is the one that we're going to deal with most of the time. Um, because it's safer, all right? And we'll study variations of this that are going to be a little bit different. But we're generally going to, when we declare an array list, we're going to put, we're going to say what class belongs in that array list. All right. One thing about array lists, and you could count this as an advantage or a disadvantage, I guess, is that you can declare an array list to contain a mix of different kinds of objects. So with an array, an array, you only have one kind of object, right? You, or, or one a primitive or an object, right? An array list can contain, first of all, it can only contain objects. That's one of the drawbacks of it. And it can contain a mix of different kinds of objects. All right? 
there can be a problem with that. We can sort of help ourselves out by declaring what kind of objects go into this array list. And then we will only be able to put those kinds of objects in this array list. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm saying I have an array list, but this array list only takes pizzas. It doesn't take other stuff. All right? So I couldn't create I couldn't create some other kind of object and try to put it in this array list. I could create an array list several different ways that could include pizzas and other things. For example, if you think an order could be for more than just pizzas, right? A lot of places sell subs and salads and other stuff too. So an order doesn't comprise just of pizzas. It comprises a bunch of things, all right? A bunch of different things. But they are related some way. There's ways, and we'll study them later on, where I could create an array list to contain all the different things that you can order from my restaurant, all right? But, strictly speaking, you could put it so that there's no restriction at all about what gets put in an array list. So your order could contain pizzas, the kitchen sink, the owner's car, you know, all crazy different kinds of combinations. So if I declare an array list like this, I can put any object in it. All right? If I create an array list like this, I can only put objects of that type in it. And that's the method that we're going to use most of the time. Because most of the time, that's probably what you want to do. Maybe we have a string for a customer. Like I said, in reality, we would probably have the customer name, phone number, address, city, state, zip, and so on. But right now, we're just going to we're just going to store the customer name. And finally, I'm going to have a private boolean that contains is it a delivery? All right. I'm going to try to compile it just as it is now to see if it works without any code in it. Now, my file name should match the class name. Should be case sensitive as well. Uh, you can get away with it on Windows, but to really make your app cross-platform compatible, keep your class name and file names case sensitive. So I called the class name order, Java, so I'm going to call the file order.java. I capitalize the O in order. I'll do that in both places. Um, okay, so I'm going to save it. Now I'm going to go to the command line. Not much in this class, but there's something specific I want to demonstrate here. How did we get to run the command line? We did it through control pan. Right. There we go. So CD, desktop. Pizza. DIR. So I'm going to type in Java C order.java. Oh, duh. 
forgot to give a list, uh, a name to my list. Private array list pizza, I'm going to call it pizzas, equals new array list pizza. All right. It's telling me it can't find the symbol. And the symbol it can't find is the symbol array list. All right. Now, notice it doesn't tell you that about string. It knows where a string is. Certain classes are like built into the main framework of Java, and you don't have to tell Java where to find it. Other classes have to tell Java where to find it. All right, and you do that via an import statement. So if I go back and look at my browser here, it says that the array list, Java util array list. All right. You can consider that to be like the array list's full name, right? Like Mike versus Mike Zellers. You know, so that's like the full name of the array list. I have the Java compiler that when I want an array list, that that's the one that I want. And I do that via an import statement. So I will put at the very top of my code, even before the class definition, Import Java Util Array List. All right. It's one of those things that, it, you know, um, as we start using more and more classes within Java, we'll be doing more and more of this. This is simply telling the Java compiler where this guy lives, where this class lives. And we have to do it, otherwise it can't find it. It doesn't know. And there's reasons for this. We'll talk about this more later on in the semester when we start talking about packages and things like that. But right now, it's important to know that if it tells you the symbol doesn't exist, you probably have to do an import. Did you have to do an import in the first lab? Maybe. Did you have to import math random or something? Or no? I don't, I don't remember. Right. Okay. All right. Fair enough. So now I'm going to save this and compile it. And now there's no errors. All right. So if you ever get that error saying it can't find a symbol, um, first of all, make sure you've spelled everything right. You know, make sure that you used uh, you know the case sensitive name for it and all that. But do double check to make sure and see if you have to import a package. All right. So now I'm going to create the classes that I said. And the first class I'm going to create is a function. It's going to be public. Not going to return anything void. And it's going to be called add pizza. Now let's imagine that you have a GUI and you're the person that is going through and you're taking the order. You might enter in the customer name and the other customer info. You might then have all the properties of a pizza that you could have. What kind do you want? Maybe radio buttons. What kind of uh, sauce? The size? Maybe a drop down. Toppings? Maybe a bunch of check boxes. Then finally, there's a button that says add to order. Well, and then it'll bring up the screen again so that they can enter in their next pizza, next pizza, next pizza. 
If you've ever ordered pizza online, that's essentially what you see, right? Um, you have a screen that will show you all the things you can put on the pizza. It might even be two or three screens that you go through. And when you're all done, boom, you say add this to order. Well, let's imagine we were writing a Java app to handle that GUI. All right? We're not doing the GUI code, but instead what we are doing is once the pizza object has been created through the GUI, we want to add this to the order. All right? So, how do we add that to the order? Well, let's look at our Java docs, and you'll see somewhere down the line here is there's an app that we can use to add the item to a specific place on the list. And I'm looking at the get item. I think when I resized it, I screwed up. There we go. to the list. Specifically, it's going to append it at the end of the list. Now, there's other functions where you could put it somewhere in the middle, all right? But we're not worried about those because the pizza doesn't really matter the order as long as you got all the items in the pizza. So there is a function on the array list called add that goes and takes the item that we give it and adds it to the end of the list. So we're going to use that when we write this function. Point add pizza. What should the argument to this function be? Should be a pizza. So I'm going to say pizza arg pizza. So this is a variable of type pizza, so I can only put pizza object references in it, and it's called arg pizza. So when we're all done, creating the pizza through the GUI, that is creating the pizza object through the GUI, we click add the order, we want to take that pizza that we just created and add it into that order. How do we add it to the order? We add it to the order by putting it in the array list for that order. So, I'm going to have the line pizzas, that's the name of my array list, dot add Arg pizza. All right. So what does this function do? It takes whatever pizza we give it and it adds it to the list of pizzas that's associated with this order. We can't really test this, right? We can compile it. Let's do that. I'm a firm believer of doing things a little bit at a time, all right? That way, when you start to have a problem with something, you see immediately. You know, we could have written this whole class and forgot to do the import, and we could be sitting there staring at it. Why isn't it telling us that, that it's there and looking at all our different code and all that when it was something so simple as we forgot the import? So write a little bit of code, compile it, test it, all right? So there's really nothing I can do to test this code quite yet. So I'm going to compile it. I'm going to, at least going to compile it. Java order, uh, Java C order, Java, and it does compile cleanly. All right, so, so far our code is correct. Now, how would I calculate the cost of this order? What's the cost of the order? In, in just people words, not computer language. Well, that's true. All those things will be factors. But how would I calculate, how would I break down and say, how do I calculate the cost of this order? Exactly. It would be the sum of the prices of the individual pizzas. All right. Now, to calculate the cost of each pizza, then you have to look at the size and the crust and all those things. But to calculate the cost of the order, it's simply the sum of all the prices of the pizza. So I want to go and I want to go and add up all of the pizzas 
that are in this array list and get their cost. Is there a function that will give me the cost of an individual pizza? Did we write a function to do that? Yes, we did. Let's look at it. We look at this pizza class. There's a function called calculate cost that does our rule for calculating a pizza. Small's worth uh, cost eight, medium's worth ten, large is worth twelve, and a dollar if it has pepperoni on it. Okay, so we have a simple rule, but we can make this rule more complicated. And here's really the beauty about object-oriented coding. If, for example, we make the rule, if we change the rule for calculating the cost of an individual pizza, maybe we charge different depending on the kind of crust or whatever. We could go and adjust the function here. We don't have to touch the order class because the order class is simply going to ask the pizza class, how much do you cost? And it's going to add that to an accumulated total. So. What I want to do is I want to go through all of the pizzas in the array list. How do I do that? How do you go through all the elements of a regular array? What's the code to go through all the elements of a regular array? A for loop. You start a variable at 0. You repeat it as long as that variable is less than what? The size of the array. So if the array had 10 elements, your for loop would look something like this. For in i equals 0, you repeat it as long as i is less than 10. Each time you loop, you increment i by 1. That's what i plus plus means. So this for loop would execute 10 times. Right? The first time I would have a value of 0. The second time I would have a value of 1. The third time I would have a value of 2, and so on. All the way through I having a value of 9. All right? Now, the problem with, well, let's, let's start the function. Public double calculate the cost of the order. Do we have to give this any arguments? No, because it already has a list of pizzas. The list of pizzas is a property of it. We've been adding pizzas to that list of pizzas. So all we have to do now is we have to loop through all of them that have been added before. So I'm going to say double cost equals 0. I'll say double order cost equals 0. Then I'm going to write my for loop. For int i equals 0, that part stays the same. i less than the number of elements in the array list, not array. Well, what's the problem with an array list? The problem with an array list is it can have a number of different items. Uh, it can have, it can, there, there's no fixed number of items that are going to be in it. One person might call up and only order one pizza. Another person might call and order five. So we have to run this loop for as many pizzas are on the order, as many pizzas are on the list. So how do we figure out how many pizzas are on the list? Well, that's where we refer back to the Java docs. And if we look here, There's a function called size that tells us the number of elements in the list. So, I will say for i equals 0, as long as i is less than pizzas dot size, then each time in the list, increment. All right, 
did that the wrong way. Now, what do I want to do each time through the loop? I want to look at the next pizza on the list. All right? I want to look at the next pizza on the list. So when i is equal to 0, I want to look at the first pizza on the list. When i equals to 1, I want to look at the second uh, pizza on the list, and so on. So I have to grab that next pizza on the list. Now, in, with arrays, you do something like this. Pizza sub i. That's what you do with arrays. But these aren't arrays. These are array lists. So I'm going to say something like this. Pizza P equals pizzas dot get I. What does this do in object-oriented terms? It calls the get method on the pizza array list, and it gives it the value of i. What's the value of i? The value of i is a counter through the array list. It starts out at 0, and it loops through for as many elements are in there. Get gives me that number from the array list. So get 0 should give me the first pizza that I added to the list. Get 1 should give me the second pizza I added to the list. Get 2 should give me the third item on the list, and so on. All right? So we're getting each pizza in a row. So I want to add pizza's cost to my running total. So order cost equals order cost plus the pizza's cost. What's the pizza's cost? Well, there's a method for that. Calculate cost. To keep consistent, I'm going to change the name of this guy to calculate cost. So for each pizza on the list, we're going to add what its cost is. It's going to do the calculation and give me the answer. I'm going to take that answer and I'm going to add it to the running total for order cost. And then when I'm done, I'm going to return that to you. All right. Questions about this code? Looking through every item in the array list. How do I know I'm getting through every item? Well, I'm starting at 0, and I'm doing this as long as my counter is less than the number of pizzas. So I'll go from, if there's 10 items, I'll go from 0 through 9. So I'm going to get each of the 10 items. I that pizza that's numbered by i. So the first time through the loop, i has a value of 0. So I get pizza 0. I that pizza, what its cost is, and I add cost of my running total. When I'm all done, that should be the cost of the whole order. Now again, remember we said we're going to add a delivery charge. We'll skip that for now. All right? For now we'll just we'll just say hey, you know, not going to worry about delivery charge. All right. So, let's go and save these and now let's change our test code, our unit test. I can actually add on to this unit test, right? I mean, that way I'm still testing the pizza to make sure. And this is a great example, I think I alluded to it last time, of what's called regression testing, right? I know that that first pizza should cost $12, and the second pizza should cost... Eleven dollars. All right. Now it changes to my code. Let's see if it still does. Well, it should because I haven't changed that calculation. But you never know what you have inadvertently broken. So it's a good idea to go and test those things. 
So I'm going to go in my unit test. I'm going to make an order. And I could do it any number of different ways. I'm going to make my order, and I'm going to say order O equals new order. O dot add pizza. P, O dot add pizza, Q, then I'm going to print out what the cost of the order is. How do I get the cost of the order? Well, it's the orders calculate cost method. So the orders calculate cost method is going to loop through all the pizzas and call its calculate cost method. Sometimes that's done, you know. Um, if, if I wanted to figure out the, the cost of a computer system, I might tally up the cost of the components, all right? Or the weight of a computer system. Well, so sum of the weight of the components, all right? The cost of an order is the sum of the pizzas on that order. So sometimes this particular thing is called delegating. In other words, the pizza order is asking the pizza, or the order is asking the pizza, how much do you cost? And it's just summing it up. I don't know if that's really delegating or not, but it's like that. OK, I'm going to save it all, and I'm going to run this. All right, no errors. Let me clear the screen. Let me say Java unit test. I forgot to put the print of the I did put the print. But I forget to save it. Oh, what's going on here? I'm going to close out everything. Oh, there's cost for order. I don't know what I was doing wrong before. And sure enough, that's correct, right? That it took the um, it took the uh, twelve dollars plus eleven dollars and added it up and got twenty three dollars. What if I only add one pizza to the order? Or if I create a third pizza?
why didn't it give me, why didn't it change the amount? So I added a third pizza. I didn't add it to the order. Right. Now you can believe one of two things. You can believe that I forgot to add it to the order, or you can believe I did that on purpose to see if you were paying attention. All right. I know what my money's on. But yeah, I created that pizza object, but I never added it to the order, so it never got included in there. So now if I do that, now it changes. So that is, and let's make sure it's correct, 12, 13, it's 25. And 11 is 36. If we were testing this, all right, we'd have to come up with a test plan. In other words, what would we test? All right. I would test, um, I would test a pizza with, uh, an order with, well, we could talk about, that'll be what we'll pick up on, on, on uh, Wednesday, how we would test this thoroughly. So what would our test plan be, all right? Because clearly, we could run it once and get an answer that was correct by fluke, all right? We could have a bug in our code that gave us the right answer, but that wouldn't mean that the code well, was correct, all right? Um, so what we would have to do is, is really write a list of potential test cases to go and test it through. Now remember in this case we have hard-coded things. Normally hard-coded isn't a good idea, but keep in mind our unit test class is replacing the GUI that we will eventually write. So those values are going to come from somewhere else, but to test our pizza and order class, we hard-code those values so that we can go in. All right? We'll pick up on testing and then we'll add a calculate um, bake time. We'll add the calculation for delivery, and we will add something else. Maybe we'll print a receipt. Maybe we will, um, I don't know, we'll do lots of things. Well, we'll add constructors definitely to the order class. All right, uh, we'll see you on Wednesday. What? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I just, that was just a moment of confusion. Yeah. <laughs>